Okay, so here you see that when we are trying to determine the placement of the electron, we, first of all, here's the thing. This was an old structure of atom, Bohr's model, you know, where fine, we understood, we thought that, okay, electrons are in a specific order, right? Electrons are placed in these energy value levels. Each energy level has a value and it looks like a very nice, neat placement. However, the real structure of atom is this. This is the real structure of atom where the energy levels, fine, we, they, they, they have a value, but at the same time, they kind of overlap. The further away you go from the nucleus, the more overlap in the energy level occurs. And so these are unfortunately not shown in your book, you know, so best is you look at these videos and try to understand from here now. Okay, so now the question is that fine, we want to place these electrons in an order around the nucleus, right? And we understand that fine, they belong to a certain energy level, but how do you locate that electron and how do you place it? So, Locating part of the electron is just like you locate an individual, right? You have, you look at the address of a person, right? If you're trying to locate someone, you look at the address, right? And then addresses tells you that what city that person is, what street that person lives on, and what's the name of that street? What is the number of that street? What is the name of the house, right? If it's an apartment, right? If it's an apartment, then fine. What is the name of that apartment? In that apartment, where is he he's living? In a one bedroom, two bedroom, you know where? Fine, even if you get into that apartment, what is the room of that individual? Which room, you know, out of two bedroom, which room? And let's say if he's, a, he's sharing that, like fine, what is the bed or the bunk bed or, you know, where? which is the bed of that person? You see that? So this is how you locate an individual. Same thing, you're going to be locating the electrons in this, in this mess you see here, this, in this 3D model. The reality, that's the reality. It's like a, like a ball, right? So where do you place these electrons or how do you locate them? So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Shell is equated to the energy level energy levels, they equal to the city. And that city is also like, there's a city has a name, so that's the shell. Next comes the subshell. Every street, every city has streets. Same as the case, every energy level or every shell will have a subshell. Then every subshell will have an orbital. So just like every street has like substreet or the houses and then there are names of the houses. So those things, the orbitals are the houses, okay? The orbital is the house. And then the electrons, electrons are the people, okay? How many people? The, the, these are the, like the, you know, the, the people who are sharing the house. So here, energy level one will have, in other words, energy level one is that, like a like a suburban place which has got only one street and the name of that street is one and the name is it's one only one street and the name of the street is one s the name of the house is one s right and there's only one house on that street and two people are living there okay so two electrons can live so this is what we talked about here so energy level one shell one it is made up of one subshell. The name of the subshell is 1s. 1s, that one subshell is made up of one orbital. That orbital is a house. The name of that orbital is 1s and two people can live, two electrons can live. And these electrons are basically spinning. One is spinning in a clockwise direction and the other is spinning in the anti-clockwise direction. So this is how you show. Next is second shell made up of two subshells. That is why you see this number here. And those two subshells are 2S and 2P names. That is the name. S is again that one street which has got the name, uh, the house is 2S. 3P, that street has got three houses and the name is 2P. 
how many people can live in uh, in the two s only two so the s can accommodate a maximum of two people only p three bedroom house can accommodate six people so the total people who can live or the total electrons who can live in the second energy level is eight okay two in the s orbital and a six in the p orbital next look at the third energy level or the third shell the third shell is made up of three subshells three subshells right here the names are 3s 3p and 3d okay the 3s subshell is made up of only one orbital the name of that orbital is 3s so you see the subshell and the name of the orbitals their names are matching 3p subshell is made up of three orbitals. The names of the three orbitals are 3p. 3d is made up of five orbitals. The name is 3d orbital. Okay, so that's one thing. Next is s, no matter what. Now you see a pattern. s, whether it is in 1s, whether it is in 2s, whether it is in 3s orbital, the s orbital will always hold two electrons. So s, whether it's 1s, 2s, or 3s, always two, maximum of two. p, whether it is in 2p, whether it's in 3p, whether it's in 4p, it will always hold six electrons. d, in 3d, 4d, 10 electrons, maximum. Okay, so that's one thing. Now 3p can hold a maximum of six electrons and 3d can hold a maximum of 10 electrons and you combine them, this is 18. So in middle school, you know, atomic structures, you must have seen it says 2, 8, 18, 32. That's where that's coming from. Let's look at the fourth energy level, the last one, like a big one. It has got four subshells. The names are 4s, 4p, 4d and 4f. 4s has only one orbital, name is 4s orbital, 4p is made up of three orbitals. So p is always made up of, so p subshell is always made up of three orbitals, whether it is in 4p, whether it's in 3p, whether it's in 2p. And the name of the subshell and the orbital same. 4d is made up of five orbitals always, d always five orbitals. 4d is the name and seven, orbitals are present in 4f subshell and the name of those orbitals are 4f okay so two electrons are present here in s all the time maximum p can hold a maximum of six d can hold a maximum of 10 and f can hold a maximum of 14 you know this information is not very clearly given in your book you know so best is to focus on like you know look at displacement and you know like this and then it will all make sense and try to look at patterns okay so 32 electrons in the last but here's a problem oh god remember that the nucleus so this is another thing with this that the nucleus is positively charged and the nucleus nucleus is positively charged and nucleus exerts its pull on the electrons so there is always going to be positive and negative. There is going to be attraction. And so there is a nuclear pull. <coughs> a nucleus is exerting its pull on the electrons because of which a certain order is maintained in 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s and 3p. But after 3p, it gets complicated. That's where, you know, nucleus begins to lose its control, its pull. Nucleus begins to feel like uh, the, the other orbitals and the other shells, energy levels come in between and they call a shielding effect. There is a shielding effect also because of which the nuclear pull decreases. Now, what is a shielding effect? It's very simple. Look at this here. In a classroom, Okay, imagine in a classroom, imagine this is a, <laughs> this is our face-to-face -face classroom, okay? You guys are sitting in a classroom, right? And you guys are sitting in the front row, right? Fine. You guys are sitting in the front row 
many of the students who are sitting in the front row, the instructors can see the students in the front row, more face-to-face -face interaction. Instructors can see what is kept on the table of the students, right? They can see whether the student is taking note on a paper or they are taking notes on the Notary app, on their iPads, or, you know, or they're just Facebooking in front, right in front of their professors, front seat of the class. So what's happening here, right? So professors can see that there's more control, that nuclear pull is there. Right? Fine. That's the first row. Second row, okay, professors can still see, you know, the students who are in the second row. And they can kind of like, they have some control. But comes the third row. And the, the first two rows, the students who are sitting in the first two rows now cause that shield. They shield the students who are sitting in the third and the last rows. And the very last, there's uh, uh, professors, I can't, can't see what they're, right? they can just see that somebody's sitting there, but what are they doing, can't see, because uh, there's a blocking, you know, so that is what shielding effect is. The students um, in the front row, like they block the view for the professors, so the control diminishes. The students who are in the last row have more freedom, so same is the case, the electrons that are further away from the nucleus have more freedom. And the electrons that are in the last shell are called a valence shell. Outermost shell electrons are the valence electrons, means that they are the outermost electrons. They have more freedom. They can easily leave the electron. Just like the students who are sitting in the absolute last row can quietly leave from the back and they can quietly leave the class, right? And sometimes, you know, professors sometimes don't even know, know that. So same story happens here. The electrons, can leave the atom from the last row, but the first row, second row, you know, a little bit of the third row, there is more control of the nucleus. So the, the electrons cannot move much. The degree of freedom is less, but the degree of freedom is more further away you go from the nucleus. Okay, now with that said, now we are going to look at the electronic configuration. Okay, electronic configuration is filling of the electrons in the energy levels. Okay, now, this is again, this piece is missing from your book. So best is, see, there are different ways of doing the electronic configuration and there are easier methods also, um, but this is one method, okay? And you can look at other methods if that work for you. But my recommendation is, here's something you can do. <coughs> you see this? One is this method, which is commonly given in the, which is commonly seen in the books, which is, where do I show this? This thing right here. One is, oh dear, sorry about that. One is this right here. This method you commonly see in the books. This is the electronic configuration, okay? Filling of the electrons in the energy levels. So one is this, if you can figure this out, good. You can use this as a reference. Or what I have done is, this is basically students like linearity, right? Oh, wait, this is the, this is the piece, this piece right here. You see, I have stretched it out. So I have like, as if this was like a rope, you know, in a zigzag fashion, and I have stretched it and I have presented it like this. The one on the top you see. So what does this mean? Let us imagine here is your periodic table. Like it is a cage. It is a cage, like blank cage, like this. Imagine there is a table here on which there are lots and lots and lots of marbles. Each of these marbles is representing electrons. Okay, so that's fine. Electrons, marbles. There are um, also, there's another bag which contains balls. Now imagine these balls, different sizes of balls and a different size represents the nucleus of the um, nucleus of the, um, of the, of the atoms, right? Now, nucleus of the atom contains neutrons and protons, okay? So leave the neutrons from one side. Focus only on the protons because protons are the ones that determine the identity of the atom. So when we talk of hydrogen, we are going to look at that ball that only contains one proton. When we are going to look at helium, then we're going to pick up the ball that only has two protons. When we're going to look at lithium, similarly, we're going to pick up only that ball, which has got three protons. 
right? So this way. So different protons means that the that ball, you know, with the different number of protons, that is very specific to the atom that we are going to, you know, look at, or we are going to consider putting in the periodic table. So this is, let's say, a blank cage. We, are, we put the cage on the table, and now we first take ball for hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, you know, and so forth, you keep going. We fill that. Now we are going to place the electrons. Pick up, the, pick up for, for hydrogen, we only need one proton. We only need one electron because we have only one proton. So where, is, where are we going to place that one electron? That one electron is going to go first to the first energy level, first subshell, name of that subshell is 1s. 1s subshell contains 1s orbital, only one orbital. And fine, we understand it can hold a maximum of two electrons, but we need to only place one electron. We, hydrogen only needs one electron. So you put that one electron in that 1s orbital, okay? So that's how you, know, you do for hydrogen. Helium needs two electrons because helium has two protons. So fine, where are those going to go? They're going to go to first energy level, first subshell. First, that first subshell is 1s. It contains 1s orbital. So from now onwards, I'm just going to look at the orbitals only because that's where the electrons are, need to be placed. So it's going to go to the 1s orbital and that 1s orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. We only need to put two electrons for helium. So 1s2 for helium. Next, lithium, three protons, three electrons. Where are we going to place them? So out of these three, we know that one S orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. So fill that first. So one S two, and then the remaining electron goes to the next energy level, which is two S. And that two S, two at second energy level, two S orbital, okay? And that two S orbital, the the other one electron that got carried over from one is, that one goes to the 2s. And we only need to place one electron. So, so it's 2s1. So it's 1s2 and 2s1. And then comes next is the beryllium. And then same is the case. Now you also can look at the energy levels that, that uh, the electronic configuration that has been shown here. So beryllium, four electrons, two electrons go in 1s2. The remaining two go in 2s2. Boron, five electrons, right? Five electrons, how are they get, going to get filled? First, they're going to go to 1s2. The remaining go to the 2s2. Then the, the other leftover goes to the 2p2. So we understand that, sorry, 2p1. We understand that p can hold a maximum of six electrons but we only need to place that one extra electron that was left over like after we placed, you know, in the case of boron, two in the S orbital, uh, then the other two S2 orbital, and then, you know, the leftover is one. So if you count, here's another thing, pay attention here. If you count these, here, uh, let me put this here, or maybe this number. Okay, right, count here, five electrons, right? These five electrons, one, so this is two plus two plus one equals five, okay? Carbon has six electrons. So those six electrons, where are they going to go? One is two, two is two, and two P two. So add this two plus two plus two, six. Seven for nitrogen, seven electrons. First two electrons go to S two because you know, that's the way it is, first energy level. Second energy level has 2s and 2p. So 2s can hold a maximum of two electrons and the remaining three electrons go to p. Similarly, oxygen. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Fluorine, same story. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then, now here's something you have to pay attention to. Okay, so this number when we write down like lit so this there's something else also i want to show you you go here 
let us save. Um, let us change it. Uh, boron, carbon, nitrogen. Let's do. Let's do fluorine. Okay, let's do fluorine. Fluorine is nine. Okay. Another way of doing this electronic configuration is using the periodic table. See, some people just memorize this. And if you can memorize, this is good. Some people are good with that, you know, and the more practice you do, it can, it can work. So one is memorization. If this doesn't work, then on the tests, I mean, I'm allowing you to use a handout. So it's okay, you can, you know, refer to this particular, if this works for you, then you can do this. Uh, sorry, then you can just use this setup, okay? But if that doesn't work, then this is a third way. Look at the periodic table, identify the location. Now we are going to look at fluorine very specifically because the other ones I had explained in the video earlier. So look at that for that. Now, but look at fluorine. Okay, so here is the fluorine. We identify where is the fluorine. It's right here. What is the placement of fluorine in the periodic table? Fluorine is present in Oh, oh, sorry. Fluorine is present in. Um, fluorine is present in which column and in which period? So fluorine is present in the second period, and it is present in the seven A column. So seven A, like group or column, and second period. Okay. So what does this mean? This means second period means this is going, that's, that's the, the, the row or the energy level. So this is the energy level. Okay. And um, uh, so this is going to end in, and it is on the P block. Remember we talked about the blocks in the periodic table. So it is in the P block. Now, here's another thing, uh, P block. If you look at the columns that are present in P block, in P block, there is one, two, three, four, five, and six columns. P can hold a maximum of six electrons. Okay, so as a result, six columns. S can hold a maximum of two electrons. So two columns. D can hold a maximum of 10 electrons. So therefore there are 10 columns. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. You see that? So this is one thing about the periodic table. So now we were talking about fluorine. So fluorine is, is present in the fifth column in the P block. Fine, it is in 7A group, but it is in the fifth column, fifth column. So where is this is going to end? This is going to end in 2P5. So you see second period is the second energy level. P block is P and five is that the column on the P block side. Okay, so this is the um, energy level or the shell number. Okay, and then this is the, this is the block and this stands for the column in that P block. So fifth column, column in P block. So this is the reason why you see fluorine is ending in 2P5, okay? So this is another way you can do is if you don't remember that. So once you identify it, that's in other words, that's where you're going to stop. So rest, what you're going to do, fill in the 1S, then go to 2S, fill S to 1S2, 2S2, and then rest is 2P5, stop. And then count the number of electrons. If it should add up to nine, okay? So this is one way you can do it, you know? And I'm pretty sure there are some other methods also, maybe there are easier methods. So <laughs> I would love to know more about those, but this is how you do the electronic configuration, okay? Now let's look at the noble gas configuration, which is also called the condensed form, condensed. This is also called the condensed form. So either way, the noble gas configuration is when you bring in the inner core, which is equal to the nearest noble gas. Now, 
nearest noble gas either is going to be for for generally is going to be one period above nearest does not mean the one right next to it no the one that is one period above so so in other words if you look at like for let's say for example sodium right here i'm going to just change it here so sodium look at sodium sodium has 11 electrons right so the inner core is like neon those 10 electrons are like neon neon has 10 electrons so the inner core is you can the placement of those electrons is exactly like that of in neon all these noble gases helium neon argon krypton xenon radon you know they have like their octets are met in other words they have eight electrons in the last shell and they are fully filled so that's why they are non-reactive also so for sodium the inner core is that of neon and then the remaining electron is just one electron so where does that electron go so you see neon is right here this is neon right here and then the remaining electron you go to the next energy level which is three and then three s block only one electron needs to be placed so that is why sodium is placed in the first column you see the group numbers group numbers are you know this is what why group 1a one electron in the last shell that's the valence electron group 2a two electrons in the last shell group 3a so this is 3a 4a 5a 6a so this is 3a 4a 5a 6a 7a and 8a so these are again the group numbers and their number of electrons in the last shell is what determines the group number and those valence electrons the last shell electrons so in the case of neon like all of them it's all going to be p6 like the p orbital is going to be filled up all filled up okay p6 ending in p6 but fluorine is going to end in p5 you know that is why it is in the fifth column oxygen is in going to end in um, like P4. That is why it is in the fourth column. If you look at it with the periodic table, so match it with the periodic table, you know. Um, and then comes the like, uh, like nitrogen. It is in the third column, P block side, you know. So that's, that's what it is. So anyway, so we were talking about sodium. That core, and then comes magnesium. Magnesium, 12 electrons the inner core the 10 electrons are placed like neon so look at the neon neon is 1s2 2s2 2p6 p is filled 2p6 eight valence electrons eight valence electrons are 2s2 and 2p6 okay so i've explained it a little bit more like i think uh, more easy like uh, like i'm not rushing you know <laughs> in um, my previous lecture on this so you can watch the video on that one also but let's look at aluminum neon inner core 10 electrons the remaining three electrons are going to go to 3s2 and 3p1 and it makes sense because aluminum is present in the third row aluminum is present on the p block and aluminum is present in the first column in the p block so you see 3p1 now here's another important thing when we talk about valence electrons, how do you identify the valence electrons? Valence electrons are the last electrons that are present in the um, last electrons that are present in the, um, uh, the highest shell number. So valence shell is the highest shell number, okay? So highest shell number, you know, although it is 2s and 2p, combine them. So it is whatever electron you have in 2s and whatever electrons are in p, you combine them. That is going to be your valence electrons, okay? Similarly, like sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, um, sodium, 3s valence electrons, 3s1. Magnesium, 3s2 valence electron. But aluminum is 3s2 and 3p1 combined. So three valence electrons. And this is the reason why aluminum is in group 3A. Magnesium has two valence electrons, group 2A. Sodium, one valence electron, 1A. Neon, eight valence electrons, 8A. 
fluorine, seven valence electrons, seven A. Oxygen, six valence electrons, six A. So you see that? So this is one thing. Next is the electronic configuration of D orbitals. These are the ones that where the overlap happens. Overlap is here, right here, after the three. So after three P six, instead of three D, four P comes, four S comes, and then comes the three D. Pay attention to that. And then four P. After four P comes four S. And then after 4s comes 4d. So it's like the reason is the energy levels. The reason is the energy levels. Okay. And so we see that that fine. S is in general lower energy state than P. P in general is a higher energy state than D. And D in general is a higher energy state than F. This is generally, you know, this is general. But you know, when it comes to the electronic configuration, electronic configuration, there can be differences. So electronic configuration, we see that 4S2 is a lower energy state than 3D10, okay? And 3D10 is a lower energy state than um, the 4P, like that. So 3D, so this is all in the increasing order of their energy state, they are arranged, this whole, this whole thing you see here. Okay, uh, what else is there? Uh, yeah, the D block, same is the case with the D block. So here's an example of manganese. Let's do another example of, let's say, I mean, I could do for, let's do zinc. Zinc is 30, let's do for zinc. Okay, electronic configuration of zinc. Zinc is 30, okay? So here we will have 30. Okay, so you look at it here. Look in, look, I'm going to just show you here. So where is zinc? You tell me, what is the, tell me what is the placement of zinc? Look in the periodic table. and tell me what is the placement of zinc? What period? What column? 11. And what? I uh, mean, what no, period? it's um, column, wait. What block? It's column 12 and it's in the transitional metals. Okay. Yeah, and what about the period? Period four. Okay, and block? It would be, is it, hold on. In the, mid, the middle one's not D. It's in D, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So the only thing is, um, so it's in the D block. And so in the D block, now tell me, in the D block, what column is that? It's it's not the 12th column, but not from that perspective. You count those block columns in the D block and tell me. Count the columns in D block. Let me put it here. Count the columns in D block. So what column is, is that? It would be 2B. No, how many columns are there in D block? Count them. There's 10. 10, very good. So this is in which column? 10. Zinc is Z and is in the 10th column, right? So mm -hmm. that clearly means that the end or the last, you know, it is going to end at 4D10. This much is clear? How to identify that? It is going to end in the fourth period? 
you, this is, you look at the row. This is the row, okay, in the periodic table. So in the fourth period and the block, block is that the middle portion, you know, where the blocks, the S, P and D block and F block. So that's what it is. So the fourth is this here, D is this, and the 10th column is this. Clear? Now we are going to do the electronic configuration of zinc. So here is your zinc, 30. Okay, now, if you look at it, so two ways, like I said, you can do. One is look at the periodic table and in the column, in that periodic table, fill in the first row. Next, go to the second row. That is 1s2 and the P can hold a maximum of six, so 2P. Then look at the third row, 3s2, 3P, six. Then comes 4s2 and here, keep this in mind here, I'm pointing this out here where I'm making a star. You see that? Here you are starting with the 4S. Yes, this is the 4S. This is 4S and this is also 4S. That one is 4S1, that is 4S2. But the the other one, the uh, this one is starting with 3D. This is all 3D. This is 3D. This is 3D. 3D. Okay, and what is that? This is 3D1, the very first one, then 3D2, then 3D3, then 3D4, then 3D5, then 3D6, then 3D7, then 3D8. This one is 3D9, and this one is 3D10. Okay, after that starts the 4P. And the 4P is, this is 4P1, this is 4P2, this is 4P3, 4P4, 4P5, and 4P6. Okay, so that's the 3D actually. So, so I mean, we will, we will, uh, um, uh, we will ending, sorry. So, so this is actually, this a uh, fourth row, but the end, this is, that is why this was, uh, I needed to clarify this. This actually is 3D10, so not 4D, although the row is there, but not four. Okay, it's 3D10, this is the correct, so so, but anyways, that number, that period signifies that. Okay, so let's do this now. So we are going to fill up now um, for zinc. One S can hold a maximum of two. Then it goes to the second shell, second subshell, second orbital holds a maximum of two, two S2, then two P6, then three S2, then three P6, three P6, then 4s2 and then 4s2 and then 3d10. Uh, now, if you count this, 2 plus 2 plus 6 plus 2 plus 6 plus 2 plus 10, it all comes out to be 30. <coughs> Excuse me, 30 electrons. Okay. Now we can condense it. We can make it into a, into a, like, um, what is it called? The, these one, two, so four plus six, 10 plus two, 12 plus six, 18. So these 18 electrons, 18 electrons, they correspond to argon. So argon is 18 electrons. So the inner core is of that argon and then comes 4s2 and 3d10. Okay, clear? These remaining ones, you just write them like that. These are left over. Okay, so the inner core is always going to be the noble gas. one row above. One row above means one period above, okay? 
So we will have now uh, the valence shell. Now the kind of question that can be asked is valence shell. Valence shell. Which one is the valence shell? Remember the highest shell number. You guys tell me highest shell number. Which one is that? Tell me and we're wrapping up. Highest. Which one is bigger? A four is bigger or three is bigger? This is the shell number, right? Which one is bigger? Three. No, bigger, mm -hmm. numerical value. Numerical value. Four is bigger. Yeah, so four is bigger than three. Even though, even though when you fill in the electronic configuration, you're filling in four as two first and then 3D. And yeah, you might say like, oh, you know, this should be bigger. Yeah, this is a bigger energy level, like energy, like it's more, D is more expanded, right? D is more. So, <coughs> but numerical value is what determines the energy level, the energy level. So four is a higher energy level than three. So therefore four S2 is the valence shell. Valence shell is the last shell. So valence shell is the last one. Okay, so 4s2 is the highest shell number. So the valency of zinc is has two valence electrons. And for that matter, all of the transition elements. So here's an interesting part. All of the transition elements will have two valence electrons, right? Because the ones that are in the D block, they are one uh, energy level lower. So what I mean to say is that these guys over here, uh, where did it go? The 3D, they, remember this is, this is four, the fourth, this is the fourth, this is the fourth, uh, how do I show this? This is, no, uh, here, this is the fourth energy level. This is the fourth, you know, 4S, but from here starts the D. From after that is the D, but it is 3D, okay? So keep that in mind that, you know, so I have filled in, sorry. I have just covered, you know, whatever the basics that we needed to cover. And if there are more questions you can ask, but for now, let's just end this and